so we're, we're going to start again uh, at the now trending MCNX. Please help me welcome Philo. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to COGAP for bringing us all together. Uh, and to you, apologize, uh, apologies for probably the most hyphenated talk title that I ever managed to come up with. Um, I came over here from uh, Slovakia, from Bratislava. Um, these are the two buildings of the Slovak National Gallery in Bratislava. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the um, neo-Renaissance style Esterazi Palace. Um, and on the left-hand side, nicely contrasting from around um, a century later, um, is this, uh, is this uh, nice building by the Slovak architect Vladimir Dedicek, uh, opened in 1977. Um, so quite a lot, of, uh, a lot of space in those bu buildings combined, but unfortunately, um, for the last few years, the building on the left uh, has been closed for uh, reconstructions. Um, and that means that the only space that we have uh, available for exhibitions are the top three floors over there in the building on the right with those wide windows. Um, so that's quite a, a limitation in terms of space that we have. And one of the things that we uh, like to do uh, in order to overcome that limitation is to think about different ways how we can extend the visitor experience beyond the gallery space. Um, and I'll be talking about um, one such occasion, one uh, project where we did such an extension. Uh, and this was a rather big exhibition called Dream Reality uh, that launched about a year and a half ago now. Um, and it was dedicated to the art and the propaganda of the first ever Slovak state between 1939 and, and 1945. Um, and this period is one of the most controversial periods in um, the history of modern Slovakia. Um, the central theme of the exhibition was the, the contrast between, on the one hand, the ideologically inspired dream of a first ever sovereign Slovak state, and on the other hand, um, uh, the painful reality of a regime that openly collaborated with Nazi Germany and the policies that, that came from there. Um, and so for the um, curatorial team, it was really important to contextualize the, the items and the, and the works in the exhibition with the historical events of that period. Um, and limited in space, they decided to uh, contact my team, uh, which is uh, the digital R&D lab uh, at the Slovak National Gallery, um, in order to figure out a way together to extend this story that the exhibition is, is telling with the historical context on the web. And um, we put ourselves the, the challenge to narrate the events of the Slovak state in a way that would be at the same time historically accurate, but also engaging to read. And so what I would like to take <coughs> you through now is some of the inspiration that inspired uh, the project and the, especially the form of the project. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the process and specifically the way we, we iterate it quickly. Um, um, it was nice that uh, accessibility has been uh, quite, quite a lot mentioned as well, and I, I also want to say something about that, um, how I thought about ex accessibility in this uh, project specifically, and the design choices that came out of that way of thinking. Uh, and, and lastly, I want to touch uh, briefly upon um, the response that we had to the project. Um, so for around five years now, we've seen uh, a lot of nice um, storytelling projects born on the web, web-native storytelling projects that focus around long-form text-driven storytelling. And because these are long-form text-driven stories, a very natural way to progress through them is by scrolling. So people also call them scrolly-telling projects. Um, and I've put here an example, a beautiful project by uh, the Welcome Collection, uh, but I could have also put here uh, the by now very famous classic Snowfall by the New York Times, which kind of kicked off this whole trend. Um, um, what I really like is that we are now after about five years, um, we don't only have 
uh, spectacular interactive one-off custom coded projects, but actually some of these trends have been productized into platforms that we use quite regularly. Platforms like medium.com um, uh, or the Dutch journalism platform, The Correspondent. Um, so these, I will say, provided a lot of inspiration uh, for us in the project. Um, so once we were kind of clear about the kind of form of um, the project, um, we started to gather uh, a team to do this. So um, obviously we, we were um, internally in the, in the Slovak National Gallery, we have a, a, a R&D lab, um, which uh, for this project included a project manager, uh, a web developer, that would be me, uh, and two content editors who worked on the project. Plus we were able to pull in from different departments, different a uh, audiovisual materials like video and audio. Um, then we worked very uh, closely with a lot of um, organizations from the gallery, library, archive and museum space or domain. Um, I've put four here, but um, there's a really, really long list. Um, and luckily those kind of relationships were already established in the preparation of the exhibition, so we didn't have to do that just for this uh, web native project. Um, and they included both national organizations and international ones. And the last category on the right is a very important category of external collaborators, because we really wanted to tell a story uh, that people would continue to read. Um, and not just publish a history lesson. And so therefore we approached the scriptwriter who has experience with um, historical documentary projects. Um, and he did a great job at structuring the story in a way that uh, was both historically accurate and, and kept people reading. Um, we also worked with a, with a web designer who did a great job at translating the exhibition design to a visual language that works really well on the, uh, for a web native reading project. Um, and lastly, we worked with two his external historians um, who proofread and fact-checked all of the material that we were putting out there. Um, so, so far, everything is going great. Um, it's two days before opening, um, and things didn't go as quickly as we hoped, of course. So, um, we don't have any finalized text content yet, <laughs> and we definitely do not have a website. So, what are we going to do? Um, well, actually, it turns out you can do quite a lot in two days. So we got together, and this was what we launched after those two days of, of work. Um, and um, what you see here is just one single, um, fairly simple landing page. Um, what it doesn't have is it doesn't have any internationalization. It's only uh, in Slovak. It's not translated. There are no subpages at all. It's just only this one landing page and it doesn't actually have any actual text content that has been written by the, the screenwriter. Um, but what we do have is we have a holistic graphic design um, that looks like, uh, gives an idea of what the final project will look like. Um, we have enough materials, including the previews of those chapters, um, to build anticipation, uh, promising the, the full breadth of the story. Um, uh, we have um, uh, an option for people to subscribe by leaving their email address to be notified when the content will, um, will be launched. Um, options to share the page on social media or via email uh, and links to more info about the exhibition. Um, and what is very important, and of course we realized this a little bit sooner, was that we were never going to have this whole project launched on the day of the launch of the exhibition. So what we thought uh, instead was we opted for a more iterative or episodic release. And, and what we thought about that was that it would be mo both useful for us in terms of making the project, making the project a reality, um, and releasing over time, but it would also be actually helpful for readers to have kind of bite-sized chapters and uh, to come on this website, leave your email address, and get a new email every time a new chapter is online. Um, and that worked uh, really nice. So that, that kind of trick that we did here is a trick that is well understood by startups. And it has everything to do with the way you slice your cake. So when you have a big, complex project with a lot of kind of complex layers 
that, it's, um, that it needs, um, very often it's useful to think about how can I slice a, a thin vertical slice out of this cake, out of this project, in a way that that one vertical slice has a little bit of every layer. So this landing page could go online in two days, and it had a little bit of graphic design, a little bit of front-end web development, a little bit of back-end development, a little bit of copywriting, and a little bit of proofreading, and a little bit of material and resource gathering. Um, and so it was the thinnest slice that we could release that would be valuable for, for visitors. Um, as we already heard, oftentimes the, the main way that people think about web accessibility is about removing barriers that make, make it difficult or impossible to use for people with disabilities. And I'm all up for that. I think we have a responsibility to make sure that our projects online and offline are accessible uh, in that way. But I also thought in this project specifically um, about accessibility a little bit differently. Um, so I wanted to take it a bit wider and, and think about accessibility as enabling as many people as possible to access content on their own terms. So to give people tools to use this website in a way that's useful for them. Um, what does that mean? Well, concretely, we wanted the content to be bite-sized. We want it to be fully responsive from mobile to desktop, and also it comes out of your printer in a nice way that is nice to read. Um, and we wanted it to be designed for reading. And that last point I want to unpack by showing uh, some of the design decisions that we made in the project. Um, so perhaps the most important question that someone, or that you ask yourself when you encounter any kind of web-published writing before you start reading is like, how much of my life am I signing away by starting to read this, right? And so in order to, rep to respect users and visitors' uh, time, we tell them in advance, hey, you are signing away six minutes of your life when you decide to read this. Or maybe you want to actually bookmark this, subscribe to the, to the newsletter, if it's clear to you that you don't have these six minutes right now. But at least now, the user can make that decision for themselves. Um, throughout, um, maybe it's nice if I just um, over here show, show it as the actual website. Live demo. Will it work? Yeah, great. So we're here, and I want to show you a couple of things about the, the chapters, because the landing page I've shown you now, you see, by the way, in the landing page, it, it, it differs very little from that first version, right? So we just added things. But because the, that thin slice was there, we didn't have to dramatically change it. Um, all right. So we have our reading time, and um, we have a chapter that is made out of several sections. And um, all these sections, they are chronologically ordered. And so one of the things, because it's rather long, one of the things we wanted to do is uh, give people a way to easily navigate that section structure. So over here, you have a timeline, um, which is a table of contents in the shape of a timeline. And we can navigate like this throughout the, the, the whole chapter. Um, right. Yes. Um, what's the next one? Oh. Maybe I'll just stay here. Um, next up. Um, because this is quite a complex topic, um, let's go to the top. Uh, it's quite a complex topic, so you might not be completely up to speed with the history of Slovakia or the figures of this regime. And you might want to expand a little bit outside of the main narrative. And so what we did in order to uh, facilitate that is to provide these thumbnails with what, uh, what we call sub-objects. So these are, in this case, it's all characters, but it can also be abstract concepts like autonomy, um, that each link to 
their own page where you can read up additional information and at the end go back to where you, where you left. Um, and lastly, um, I want to show you um, one feature where we were actually able to leverage our own uh, collection management platform, uh, which is called WebUmania. Um, and on WebUmania, we have this nice feature that allows you to zoom in all the way one-to-one -to, -one to every artwork that we have on there. So um, that is quite nice um, to have that. And because we had that already developed on our own collection management platform, we could simply embed the artworks that were already hosted there for the exhibition on this project. Okay. Yep. So, um, I'm keeping an eye on time. Um, we stood on the shoulders of many giants, so I've just mentioned our own collection management platform. Um, we also needed to give access to editors to edit text and intersperse it with audiovisual material. Um, so we needed some kind of content management system. Um, and we used a content management system called Graph, which is open source and flat file, which um, uh, means that it doesn't have a database. And if you want to know why that is useful, come talk to me afterwards. Um, we also used MailChimp, which is just an off-the-shelf, free-to-get-started tool up to 2,000 subscribers in order to establish the relationship where people can leave their email address, which was really useful. Now, before I talk a little bit about um, the way we shared this story, I want to touch shortly upon the kind of context in which we are sharing this story about this um, problematic part of history. Um, and I will do that by quoting our director, Alexandra Kusa, um, and she says, the intention of dealing with the period of uh, 39 to 45 has appeared in our exhibition plans for several years. When work on the project began two years ago, none of us had any idea of the mood in society this project would eventually encounter. Now we know. And what we know now is that in 2016, in the national elections of Slovakia, 8% of the population voted for an extreme right neo-Nazi party that is, didn't make it into, uh, into the government, but 8% and they have a significant number of seats in the, um, in the, in the government. So this kind of context along with all sorts of nasty misinformation campaigns is what you can find online. Um, if you Google for the topics and the, fi and, the, and the people who are involved in this regime. And so for us it was really important to, to share this story online to compete with those kind of things. So of course, basic thing that we needed to do is really do good search engine optimization. Uh, we shared posts by ourselves uh, on social media. In Slovakia that means Facebook. Um, and we partnered with, again, those similar kind of civic organizations to also share it on their social media and on their websites through links and banners. Um, then we also paid for the promotion, so we used paid promoted posts on Facebook, and we also used paid Google AdWords, again, for the very names of uh, characters from the regime um, in, in order to compete uh, with those other kind of campaigns and websites. Um, Really short, I don't think it's really about the numbers, but uh, some people might be interested in uh, the year after we launched the website, uh, we had uh, just under 22,000 sessions, um, and uh, what, what Google Analytics called, se called sessions, with an average duration of four minutes, 18 seconds, um, which, again, I, it's not so much about the numbers, and this isn't anything massive in terms of web projects, um, but I think it's encouraging considering the type of content that we're sharing here. Um, uh, the most important thing, perhaps, is that by providing this lasting resource, because this is going to stay online for at least five years, hopefully longer, um, we provided people with resources that started conversation. Um, and, and this is, I think, the most meaningful way to have impact with a project like this. Um, so I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation over drinks, um, and for now, Thank you very much. And please visit the project. It's completely translated in English.
institutions because that's something that's not necessarily done enough in the museum gallery industry. And I'm wondering like what worked and what enabled you to cooperate um, Yeah, good question. I think, um, first of all, this wasn't me. So I've done, I've led the, the development of the website. So I was not involved with any of those partnerships. Um, what I think helped us in, in terms of uh, people uh, who worked on the project um, was, of course, that those, most of those partnerships were already established in the two years of curation that, that led up to the, to the exhibition. Um, and then also, on top of that, it helps that we are the Slovak National Gallery, so everyone knows us, everyone knows that we, have, we, we, we are able to pull something off. Um, and we have, of course, it's a controversial part of history, but it is something that people are committed to, and especially those civic organizations, they want to help the mission of the first ever art historical interrogation of this period in history. Any more questions? <laughs>